Today, it was the war for Israel's survival. Jerusalem is the flashpoint. Jerusalem is the epicenter. But you'll never guess how close America came to Armageddon. This took the conflict to an entirely different level. Then, the next thing I remember was her just scream, tree. A drunk driver blacks out. And they say, well, you were in a bad accident. You hit a tree. And wakes up a murderer. I look at the headline and it says, crash, victim, dies. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. For decades, I personally have suffered uh, when I watched the federal judiciary destroy the moral fabric of this nation, a runaway Supreme Court, and we have things that we never dreamed were possible a few years ago, a distortion of the Constitution, removal of many of our liberties, and errant decisions that went way away from what the Constitution intended. Well, something good is going to happen because President Trump is now saying, I'm going to put on judges, and there are well over 100 vacancies, where he's going to put in especially circuit court judges. And uh, they say we might restore the balance. Right now, there are more so-called liberal judges on their appellate courts than there are uh, district, I mean, uh, conservatives. And there's something else that I wish Congress would do. I think it's possible for them to limit the jurisdiction of any judge they want to. It's in the Constitution. They can establish lower courts and their jurisdiction. And I think that what's got to be done is to say a district court judge has no authority beyond the district in which he presides. And the idea of a judge in Hawaii making a, a, a ruling that controls the action of the President of the United States and the Congress of the United States is outrageous. I mean, there's no way that a district court judges have that kind of authority, but they're taking it all around the country because they're runaway and they don't abide by the Constitution. So that's kind of good news, and it's coming down the pike right now. That's right, Pat. The president has named his first 10 nominees for federal judgeships, and two of them are possible nominees for the Supreme Court. Ben Kennedy has the story from Washington. Is With the confirmation of Justice Neil Gorsuch complete, President Trump has turned his sights to the lower federal courts. On Monday, the White House announced 10 nominees, including Justice Joan Larson of Michigan and Justice David Strass of Minnesota, to fill the open seats on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the six and eight circuits. And both have been pegged as potential nominees for the Supreme Court. These people will be serving for the rest of their lives. It's life term, it's generations of impact on American law. And so seeing a president who makes that such a priority is very refreshing. Conservative groups like Judicial Crisis Network praised the president's nominees. Their chief counsel, Kerry Severino, told CBN News that Trump is knocking it out of the park by fulfilling his campaign promise to appoint strong, principal judges. And Kerry, do you feel with these nominees that President Trump is fulfilling his campaign promises? Oh, yeah. I think, I mean, we saw out of the gate Justice Gorsuch was a really big fulfillment of that campaign promise. But these are also incredibly important steps in that process. The White House nominees are far from over. In fact, President Trump has more than 100 openings on the lower federal courts. Trump has hailed the confirmation of Gorsuch as a key achievement in his first days in office. And odds are the new list of nominees will follow along the same lines as Gorsuch, which could reshape the federal judiciary. These 10 individuals that the president has chosen were chosen for their deep knowledge of the law and their commitment to upholding constitutional principles. Democrats removed the filibuster for lower court nominees back in 2013, so Trump's picks are expected to have a smooth approval process in the Republican-controlled Senate. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Ben. In other news, some members of Congress are still looking for a possible connection between Trump's campaign and the Russians. I think that's a lot of smoke and mirrors. It has no substance whatsoever. But nevertheless, the Democrats are just looking for any possibility to derail Trump. John Wayne Jessup has that story. 
That's right, Pat. During her Senate testimony Monday, former acting Attorney General Sally Yates said she bluntly warned the Trump White House in January that its new national security advisor essentially could be blackmailed by the Russians. And former National Security Chief James Clapper said there's no collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign. Charlene Aaron has a story. Former Acting Attorney General Sally Yates told a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee that just days after the inauguration, she warned the White House about National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Yates testified she issued the warning because Flynn had apparently lied to his bosses about his contacts with Moscow's ambassador in Washington. The vice president was unknowingly making false statements to the public and because we believed that General Flynn was compromised with respect to the Russians. We believe that the Russians knew this and that created a compromise situation, a situation where the national security advisor essentially could be blackmailed by the Russians. The White House later fired Flynn for misleading Vice President Pence and other administration officials. President Trump later fired Yates for refusing to enforce his travel ban. Yates was also joined by the former director of national intelligence, James Clapper. Both were asked if they had been the source of or had authorized any of those leaks of classified information. Have either of you ever been an anonymous source in a news report about matters relating to Mr. Trump, his associates, or Russians' attempt to meddle in the election? No. Absolutely not. Yates and Clapper said they did see the names of Americans who have been picked up in the course of intelligence gatherings. Those names are usually kept secret but can be unmasked. Clapper highlighted Russia's hacking involvement in the 2016 presidential election. The intelligence community assessment concluded first that President Putin directed an influence campaign to erode the faith and confidence of the American people in our presidential election process. But he says there's no evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. And President Trump blasted the hearing, saying there was nothing new. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Pat, emphatic denials by both witnesses about leaking that information. Well, you know, it's, it's old news, and uh, they fired Flynn, and so he... Uh, he was compromised, so they were warned, and they didn't act uh, with alacrity, but they did act after he clearly uh, lied to the vice president. I don't know what was wrong with that man. He's had a distinguished career, and what they've pointed out clearly is that his security clearance came from the Obama administration. He was completely vetted by the Obama administration, and the things that have been brought to light were all done during his service in the Obama administration. So I read from time to time people are talking about, quote, impeaching the president. I want to point out the impeachment process starts, first of all, with a bill from the House. As long as the Republicans control the House, such a thing is not going to happen. Secondly, it has to be approved by two-thirds vote in the Senate, and that isn't going to happen either. So it's almost impossible to impeach somebody in, under the rules of the Constitution. So people are talking about impeaching the president because of some I interference by the Russians. It just, there's no there there. It just isn't there. And uh, I'm tired of hearing about it, but the Democrats are going to do everything they can to destroy this president. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to pray for him, John. Pat, clearly there's a lot of bad political blood flowing through our nation's capital, and one relationship can be described as love-hate, and that's the one that exists between President Trump and the major media. David Brody takes a closer look at this never-ending roller coaster ride. Media outlets like CNN and MSNBC are fake news. Here's some real news. President Trump likes going after the mainstream media, even calling them the enemy of the American people. And his opponent doesn't mind punching back. We are not fake news. We are not failing news organizations. And we are not the enemy of the American people. The gloves came off at the president's very first press conference. The public doesn't believe you people anymore. The Where are you from? Uh, BBC. Okay. Here's another beauty. It's a good line. Impartial, free and fair. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, Mr. President. Just like CNN, right? Um, 
I know there's going to be a bad question, but that's okay. I want to find a friendly reporter. Good luck finding that. A Media Research Center study shows that 89% of the Trump coverage by the major media networks is negative. Former campaign manager Corey Lewandowski believes this treatment is intentional. They want to highlight what they perceive to be failures. This is exactly what they did during the campaign. They said the president would never run, he could never be successful, the campaign was in shambles, it wasn't sophisticated enough, and the American people stepped up and said, we want Donald Trump, and they voted for him. Lewandowski says all President Trump wants is a fair shake and the whole story to be told. When he does a long interview with a, a major publication, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, all he asks for is, don't edit it, just print it verbatim. And if you do that, he believes that to be a fair interview, and I agree with him. It's when they cut it up and they chop it up and they don't run the full context of what he's saying is where usually the media you know, tends to perpetuate a narrative which isn't true from the president. But there's pushback from the mainstream media team. He loves the media in many ways as much as he hates it. Paul Fari is the Washington Post media reporter. Well, I think Trump makes a very big show of disliking us, disrespecting us, and disparaging us. But in fact, I think secretly or maybe not so secretly, he really likes us, loves the attention, has used that attention for his own advancement, and has really courted the media in a lot of ways. He sure has. Trump courts the media using handwritten notes to either praise or blast them. But he definitely works the room. Trump is a very sophisticated media animal. He has worked with uh, the New York media, which is the most intense, for decades. He knows his way around, and he knows how to utilize the media to get his message out. So will we continue to see this daily soap opera drama play out the next four years? Jake Sherman is with Politico. Donald Trump is 70 years old. Uh, he's not going to change. So mm -hmm. if we're looking for some sort of uh, major course correction or uh, major shift in, in dynamics, we're not going to get that. This is, you know, he is who he is, and you're not going to change that at this point in the game. The one thing Donald Trump could look to change is this country's libel and slander laws that make it easier to sue reporters and media outlets over their stories. That could be the next step in this escalating fight. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, David. Well, in a surprise ruling, the governor of Jakarta is going to an Indonesian prison on blasphemy charges. A court in Indonesia sentenced Governor Basuki Jahia Punama, known as a hoax, to two years for blasphemy against the Quran. He said that people during a recent campaign were being deceived if they believed a specific verse in the Quran forbids Muslims from voting for non-Muslims. He also said he never meant to insult the Quran. Still, the former governor is immensely popular in Jakarta. Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim nation, and Pat, the unexpected ruling undermines its reputation as a country known for practicing a more moderate form of Islam. Uh, David, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm appalled at this ruling. It's just absurd. Uh, he insulted the Koran because he, he misinterpreted a verse or he applied a verse in a particular session. And to, to, to remove him from office and uh, charge him with a crime of blasphemy in a country like Indonesia, which is a very moderate democracy. It's just, it ruined the country. I mean, the, I hope that, I don't know if there's any uh, uh, appeals court that they can uh, re rely on for that, but I'm a fan of Indonesia. It's a great country. We have wonderful relations with Indonesia. And uh, you know, although it is the largest Muslim country, you never saw that included in the travel ban, for example, or anything that was being done. So I think this ruling uh, is, oh, it just is a black eye on the Indonesian democracy, which we all applaud. John? Pat, President Trump is considering sending, sending thousands of more troops to Afghanistan, a move that would reverse President Obama's decision to limit the U.S. military role there. The new strategy would also give the military greater authority to use airstrikes against the Taliban. The war is now in its third American presidency, and it has cost the U.S. $66 billion to equip and support Afghan troops. But they haven't been able to break the Taliban's grip on the group's territorial strongholds. Analysts warn that the situation is getting worse, but it isn't clear if the president will approve sending additional troops. Pat, now in its 16th year, this has become America's longest war. Um. I, for one, think that mountainous sinkhole, we ought to, you know, wash your hands and declare victory and leave. To spend in more troops, it's the longest war maybe in America's history. Afghanistan, I mean, good grief. 
Alexander the Great couldn't make it there, and I'm not sure we could either. And, and the, the Russians, I, I was there on the border of Afghanistan when the Russians were in there, and the Russians had to pull up stakes and move out because they couldn't control that country. Um, they're a fierce nation, and they're deeply divided. The Pashtuns, one group, and another group, and, and the Taliban, another group. And what's going to happen? We'll have an ally of Pakistan, probably. And what are they going to do? They're going to, they can't make atomic weapons. They don't have any missiles. The danger is Iran, Iran and North Korea. And I think uh, uh, to double up the bet on Afghanistan, even if you win it, what have you got? That's my uh, humble opinion. I'm sure experts would say I'm completely wrong on that. But if, <laughs> Wendy, I mean, like enough already. I mean, if you've been there, there's mountains and desert and <laughs> poverty and, and, and troops trained by us who shoot our own soldiers. I mean, it's a horrible mess. But you don't think it would create a vacuum where more bad guys could get in? Well, there are all those tribal chieftains. You remember the Northern yeah. Alliance? You remember all that stuff? Well, they're still tribal chieftains, and they're the ones that run the country. And on, on top of that, uh, we could have uh, curtailed that opium population. They sell an awful lot of heroin out of Afghanistan, and we haven't done one blessed thing to curtail it. We could have sprayed those crops, killed the heroin. Yeah. I mean, the, the opium poppies didn't do it because that's their money crop. So, I mean, it's crazy. And so they're exporting all this heroin to hook our kids while we're spending billions of dollars to maintain them. And for what? Mm. You, you remember that president they had over there? You know, he was terrible. And he, he then came out with statements against America. I mean, it, yeah. I, I tell you, uh, it's <laughs> but some wiser heads may say, no, let's double up. Well, let, let's have a surge. I don't think so. All right. All right. Well, coming up, the battle cry that ignited Jews all over the world. When Mordechai Gur, the Israeli general, said on the radio, the Temple Mount is in our hands, it electrified Jewish communities all over the planet. Best-selling author Joel Rosenberg talks about the prophetic significance of the Six-Day War and of the Jews' return to the land of Israel. You don't want to miss this. Well, a new nation was formed. The Arab nations came in to crush it. And then uh, over the years, they struggled. And finally, there was a war fought that was started, I may add, by, yes, uh, by, by uh, Abdel Nasser of Egypt. Uh, and it was called the Six-Day War, 1967. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. And it pitted a relatively young Israel against five established Arab armies. Many people don't realize that one of the world's superpowers also came dangerously close to entering the war. Well, as our Chris Mitchell reports, that led to fears of a potential Armageddon. June 5, 1967. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol sent a cable to President Lyndon Johnson informing war had begun. He wrote, Israel's existence and integrity have been endangered. He added a request prevent the Soviet Union from exploiting and enlarging the conflict at Israel's greatest hour of danger. What most people don't realize is that the actor that was perhaps the most dangerous, but operating sort of behind the scenes, was the Soviet Union. Middle East expert Joel Rosenberg says, while Israel faced the combined might of Arab countries, it was the Soviet Union casting a giant shadow over the war. Now, June 5th, 1967, uh, the morning that uh, Eshkol orders Israeli bombers into action and they're successful, Soviet Premier Kosygin dials the hotline right into the White House and demands to talk to uh, President Johnson. Now, the hotline was rarely used except in the most extreme crises. And the message that Kosygin sent heavily implied that if the United States didn't force Israel to back down, that the Soviets were going to take direct military action. And this took the conflict to an entirely different level. 
President Johnson had told ESCO the U.S. might cut off political and military assistance to Israel in case of a preemptive strike. So uh, Israeli, the Israeli leadership was already taking a huge risk that Johnson would keep his word. Once the Soviets got involved, a dynamic changed. Suddenly, the Johnson White House saw the conflict not simply in terms of Israeli, Egyptian, Israeli, Syrian terms, but in U.S. Soviet terms. That led Johnson to send the Sixth Fleet steaming towards Israel as a show of support. Would you say the fact that the uh, Soviets never did get into the war uh, part of the miracle of the Six Day War? I think it's one of the untold stories uh, uh, or, or rarely told stories of God's protection of Israel is the fact that the Soviets seemed to come so close that they were threatening at the, at, at, to the Americans, to the Israelis directly. They were promising the, the, their Arab allies that they were going to do more, and then they were actually moving uh, military forces closer and closer to Israel. Rosenberg also sees the war as a prophetic milestone. The Bible does say that Jerusalem will come back under Jewish control, and it happened in June of 1967. The Bible says that Judea and Samaria, what the world calls the West Bank, will be in Jewish hands. It's part of the biblical heartland. And, that, and God says he will restore the land and he'll restore the people to the land. And I think that you also see uh, God giving this land uh, back to the Jewish people. Not because we deserve it, but because God had promised it. The Six Day War became a turning point for Jewish immigration to the land of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, uh, God says that he's going to draw the Jewish people back to the land. But what's interesting is that at that moment, when Mordecai Gur, the, the Israeli general, was said on the radio, the Temple Mount is in our hand. When that was broadcast, not just through Israel, but worldwide, it electrified Jewish communities all over the planet. The level of Aliyah, Jews leaving their exile countries and coming back to the land of their forefathers, skyrocketed in the years ahead. Although Israel survived one of its darkest moments, Rosenberg says it still faces threats from the north, backed by a familiar interloper. I see that the Russians are very actively moving into this region. They have made Iran their primary ally, and now they're working hand in glove with Iran to prop up Bashar al-Assad, who has slaughtered some 500,000 people in Syria. So you now have Russian forces, Iranian forces, helping Syrian forces just a few miles north of Israel. 50 years since the battle for Jerusalem, Rosenberg says Israel and its capital remain on the front lines. Jerusalem was reunited 50 years ago, but the battle for Jerusalem remains. It's a political battle. It's an economic battle. There are people trying to isolate Israel politically around the world. Jerusalem is the flashpoint. Jerusalem is the epicenter. Uh, for, you know, 4,000 years, people have wanted this city and they have fought hard to get it. And so... The fact that Israel controls it today uh, is biblical, it's prophetic, but it's also complicated. And we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem and praying for Israel to be secure. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. There's one very important prophetic word that uh, is so significant. Jesus made this statement, Jerusalem uh, uh, shall be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, since Nebuchadnezzar, 586 B.C., Jerusalem has been underfoot of the Gentiles until the Six-Day War. At the end of the Six-Day War, the Jews had taken the whole city of Jerusalem, the East Jerusalem, Western Jerusalem. They had the whole city and the Temple Mount. For the first time in history, and I will tell you right now, that's one prophecy that will not be broken. And so I warn the people who are making decisions in America, those who are around the world, the United Nations, who are trying to take uh, Jerusalem away from the Jews, 
uh, you will be facing up to the judgment of God because God's Word is immutable, and that's one that is going to stand. And it came to pass during the Six-Day War when the Jews finally, after all those years, 2,500 years or so, finally took Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. We are in the time of the fulfillment of the Gentiles' powers. And I wouldn't be at all surprised that as this cooks itself up, we're going to see a huge financial crash on the Gentile nations. I think we're building up a debt bubble that is so intense and so monumental that when it breaks, it's going to bring chaos and suffering to billions of people around the world. The Gentiles will be in turmoil, and that will include China, it will include Russia, it will include the United States. Keep your eyes on it. But I think Jerusalem is God's, uh, well, it's His time, uh, uh, His arrow, His uh, uh, appointed moment. But uh, keep that in mind. And also there's some other prophecies I won't go into right now about what's going to happen in the last days. Zechariah talks about Jerusalem being attacked by armies, but we won't get into that right now. Yeah, the Bible says when Jesus comes back, He's coming back to Jerusalem. That's right. He's not coming his back to New York City or his feet, anywhere else. His feet will stand on the mm -hmm. Mount of Olives. That's what He said. I've been there on the Mount of Olives, and you look down, there's an old rusted out car, and uh, you know, some a bunch of sheep and cattle, and, and it's just a, a wasteland, but that's where he's going to come back. His yeah. feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I've looked at that site myself, yeah. <laughs> and it, um, it makes you think. Yeah. Okay. Well, In Our Hands, the Battle for Jerusalem hits theaters on May 23rd for a one-night-only Fathom event. Just go to inourhands1967.com. That's inourhands1967.com to purchase your ticket. You don't want to miss it. Well, up next, a young man makes a fatal choice when he decides to drive drunk. I look at the headline and it says, crash, victim, dies. Here I sit, 23, with the reality that I'm responsible for killing somebody. See how this man's life is transformed by forgiveness from the family of his victim. Nathan Harmon was just 23 years old when he made a shocking discovery. He opened the newspaper and he read the headlines and found out that he was responsible for killing someone. My dad sat down and looked at my sister and looked at me and said, your mother and I are going to separate. We're going to get a divorce. And that blindsided me. At first, it didn't make sense to 12-year-old Nathan Harmon why his parents divorced. In his eyes, they were good Christians who raised their family to love and trust God. Later, the pieces started coming together. I began to find out um, slowly that my dad struggled with alcohol, my mom struggled with alcohol, my dad had some struggles with some fidelity. Um, it broke me because I thought our family was that cookie-cutter family um, that was perfect. I remember looking at them both and saying, I will never be like you. Nathan felt his parents weren't the only ones who had betrayed him. I began to attach my emotion and the blame a lot on God. And so I got angry at God. He slowly turned away from church. By my junior, I was a full-blown alcoholic. I'm smoking marijuana. I'm snorting cocaine. I'm popping pills. I, I want to feel loved. I want to feel accepted. I'm trying to feel hurts and pains. And, and so instead of now leaning towards God and the youth groups and the body of people around me that care, those voids are still there. Now I'm plugging it with alcohol and I'm plugging it with getting high. His senior year, Nathan was expelled for skipping school and failing his classes. Afterwards, he joined the Army, trying to get a new start. I was serious about changing my life. That was a moment that I was like, I'm going to come back from the Army and I'm going to be different and I'm going to be a totally brand new man. But after boot camp, he fell back to his old habits and was kicked out of the army for drugs and going AWOL. He stayed with friends and worked minimum wage jobs, spending his money on alcohol. By now, he felt even God wouldn't want him. I just began to really believe that I had made too many mistakes and this is all that life has for you now. 
It was drugs, alcohol, and nothingness. Just a sense of hopelessness, you know. Then late one Friday, Nathan met up with a friend at a bar, and they decided to go to a party. I was really drunk. She had just showed up, she was sober, but the process from leaving the bar and getting into her Jeep, somehow I got the keys. The next thing I remember was her just scream, tree. And I looked right, and I see her blonde hair in her face and everything froze. And I just hear like that word tree, and it was black. I woke up then, I was in a helicopter, and it was windy and it was cold. And I woke up in a hospital with police officers over top of me asking me questions. And I was asking, what's, what's going on, what's going on? Because I'm clueless, I'm, I, I, my ankle's throbbing, it's broken. And they said, well, you were in a bad accident. You hit a tree. Nathan asked about his friend, but got no answers. By now, his mom was there and took him home with her. The next morning, he went out to get the paper. And I unroll it, and I look at the headline, and it says, crash, victim, dies. And my world just stops. Shame, I mean, guilt, I, I can't even fathom. And here I sit, 23, the reality that I'm responsible for killing somebody. A few days later, Nathan heard that the woman's family asked him to contact them. I didn't know what to expect. How do you even begin to pick up a phone and call somebody and say, I'm sorry? But I did. And they just right away just said, Nathan, we just want you to know that there's no reason that two lives and two families are destroyed from one poor choice. And this family said, I forgive you. I didn't deserve a family to forgive me. If anything, I deserved to be the kid that got what he finally deserved. I deserve them to hate me. I deserve them to want me in prison for the rest of my life. I deserve my life to be over. And when that family just said, we forgive you, and they meant it, it messed my world up. I couldn't explain it. And I couldn't keep running from God. Later, Nathan was arrested and charged with reckless homicide. He recalls his first night in jail, the same night he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. I said, God, I have no idea what's ahead of me. I have no idea how long I'm going to be gone for. But regardless if it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, I need you in my life. Forgive me. And this is the most unbelievable presence of God. It seemed like it just filled up that cell. And I had such a peace. Nathan signed a plea agreement for 15 years with five suspended. From the start, he used his time behind bars to serve God. I began to really just pursue everything that God had for me and letting my life now be his life for him to use as that, just to be his hands and feet, you know, to teach people how to love, live, and look like Jesus to let people know there's hope. Nathan was released after just two and a half years. Today, he's a pastor and speaker sharing how God's grace can free you from the burdens of your past. No matter what I did, the plan would fail, but I never got what I deserved. And it was always that grace and it was always that mercy. God was just after me. It's what God's after all of us. He, Jesus is just pursuing us, you know. I was reading today in the book of Romans where Paul is saying, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if while we were still enemies, he brought us to forgiveness and salvation, how much more by his grace will we be saved from the wrath of God? While we were his enemies, he died for us. While we were yet sinners, he died. And yet, through his grace, we will now be saved from the wrath of God. Nathan should have had the wrath of those people, but they didn't, he didn't get it because they had met 
the Lord. And they were exhibiting the same attitude that God will exhibit toward you if you come to his Son. Even though you're an enemy, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He said, you know, you might sometime give your life for a righteous man, but not for an enemy. But Christ died for us when we were sinners, and we were his enemies, and he gave us his life. And because of his life, we will be spared from the wrath of God. That's what the Bible says. But you have to accept it. Will you take it? Nathan accepted the forgiveness those people offered him. And his life was transformed. And God says to you, you may be an enemy of God. You may be a sinner. But God holds out to you the promise of forgiveness and absolute pardon if you'll accept it. So once again on this program, it's my privilege to offer you that forgiveness. If you'll pray with me right now, good things will happen. So bow your head. You don't want to face the wrath of God, trust me. Bow your head and pray. Lord Jesus, that's right, pray with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You know I haven't lived for you. And you know the terrible things I've done. But Lord, I know that you died for sinners. And you died for me. And so at this moment, I turn from sin, and I turn to you, and I say, Lord, now come into my heart. Live in me, and I will live for you, and I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my prayer. Thank you that you've come into my life. And if you prayed that prayer with me, God's got some good things for you. Now that you have been justified by his grace, you will be spared from the wrath of God that is to come. And I want you to understand that. And I also want you to understand what you've just done. These are important decisions. And you've just made a very important decision. And I'd like to help you. We've got this thing we've given. I've mentioned it so many times, but it's still pretty good stuff. It's a, it's a compact disc. And it's also a little booklet, and it'll tell you what you've just done. It's free. I'm not going to charge you. There's no money. I'm not going to charge you anything for it. It's all free. And um, you can just call. But just say, I prayed with Pat, gave my heart to the Lord. And the number is easy to remember. It's 700-7000. It's an 800 number on it. It's toll free, 1-800-700-7000. And just say, I just prayed. I've just found the Lord, and I've got peace with God, and I'm going to be spared from the wrath. To come. Wendy. All right, thanks, Pat. Still ahead, we've got your email questions. One of our viewers says, When I pray for others, I feel God hears me, but when I pray for myself, there's silence. What is someone like me supposed to do? Stay tuned for Pat's answer that's coming up later. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The cashless society may be getting closer. Reuters reported a recent study that found that more than a third of Europeans and Americans say they'd be happy to go without cash and just use electronic payments. The study also found that at least 20% in Europe and 34% in the U.S. already say they rarely use cash. 82 girls from the Chibok region of Nigeria are enjoying their freedom this week after they were released by the radical Islamic group Boko Haram Saturday. They were received by the Nigerian president's chief of staff in Abuja Sunday. Five Boko Haram commanders were also released in exchange to free the girls. That is according to the Nigerian government. Authorities say 113 girls remain missing of the 276 who were abducted from their boarding school back in 2014. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with much more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com.
Hey, you're watching the 700 Club. So happy to have you with us. Bioletta's youngest son, Juan, was in danger. He'd lost half his body weight, and he almost died. Juan needed surgery, but Bioletta had no money to pay for it. So she turned to God, and she said, God, please help me. Juan was born with a cleft palate. He lives in a small Guatemalan village with his older brother and sister. His mom is a 29-year-old single mother who struggles just to feed her three children. Sometimes I wash people's clothes and make tortillas from corn flour when someone hires me. But helping Juan to consume enough calories has been her biggest challenge. Milk and food fell from his mouth. He was eager to eat and drink, but he could not swallow. It dropped through his lip. Even Juan's sister, Crystal, knew he was in trouble. He got very thin and couldn't eat anything. At one point, Juan lost nearly half of his body weight due to an illness and not eating enough. He had to stay in the hospital for a week. He almost died. I prayed and asked God to send me people who could help my son. He answered my prayers when you came. When CBN met the family, we quickly arranged for Juan to travel to the city to receive free cleft lip surgery. The doctor sued his lip, and now he's very pretty. Several months after surgery, Juan is doing great. I bless CBN for helping my son, for being the miracle that I needed for him. I'm very happy. Thank God they operated on my little brother. Well, you were there. And you say, I didn't know those people were alive. No, you didn't. You never met them. But you reached out and helped them. And what does it take to do that? A 700 Club membership is just 65 cents a day. And you know, 65 cents used to mean something. I mean, a, a nickel was a lot. When I was growing up, a nickel bought you an ice cream cone. Now, <laughs> about five bucks buys you an ice cream cone <laughs> with two dibs. That's right, yeah. at least. So yeah. 450 whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so 65 cents, but together, it'd make it a lot of money, see? So it's $20 a month, you join the 700 Club, and or you can do whatever you feel like doing. But um, I want to give you this. Uh, our producer, Edie Wasserberg, is so talented. And she uh, had Scott Ross and me in the studio, and she said, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to talk about miracles. I want you to teach on miracles. I want you to bring before the people some actual miracles, people who have had miracles from God. This is a dynamic thing that we're offering. It's called miracles. Yeah, one of my favorite things that you taught on yeah. in this teaching is when you said it is our normal inheritance. Miracles and healing as children of God, it's our normal uh, yeah. inheritance. Yeah. And that just stuck uh, with yeah. me. Yeah. It is. And I love that. Well, mm -hmm. this is part of the teaching. <laughs> and we give this to you as our gift when you join the seven hundred. So please pick up the phone call. Again, toll free. It's 707,000 with an 800 number attached. 707,000. And uh, yes, it's your normal and terrorist. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, up next, we're going to bring it on with your email questions. So stay tuned. <laughs> Regent University, ladies and gentlemen, we just finished the largest graduation in history. We had 1,920 graduates. And right now, Regent has 128 areas of study. Something new, a Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity, that's hot, and also a Master of Science in Cosmogony, which is also very hot. And um, we are, have... Uh, flexible eight and 15 week uh, courses. And I'm pleased to report Regent University is the fastest growing university in the United States of America, bar none, it is number one. And uh, so if you want to participate, uh, it's Christian leadership to change the world. It's in my opinion, the, well, one of the world's great universities. You can call in, the number is 1-866-910-7612. That number's on your screen. What was that yeah. last one? Cosmogony? Cosmogony. Okay. Uh, I wanted to call it cos 
cosmology, and that was talking about it, and then cosmogony is the origin of it. So it's the origin of the cosmos. Oh my goodness! And How it's cool going is to be—it's a, it's a compulsory course for everybody in the School of Divinity. We have a thousand students in the School of Divinity, on the way to two thousand. Every one of them will have a course. So when they get through, they will know the real solid science. They won't mm. be off into some creation science or some kind of screwy thing. Mm. It'll be the real good. Cosmology. Well, and we give a master's degree in. That's incredible. Well, are you ready for a couple emails? I'll let you know when you ask me the okay, email. Okay, here's right. one from this viewer. She says, I'm an old Christian, uh, saved at an early age. When I pray for others, I feel God hears me. But when I pray for myself, silence. What is someone like me supposed to do? I need healing of many, many internal problems and need to get out of debt. I hear you say God is faithful. I agree. He's faithful for many others. I love the Lord, but I'm afraid. Oh, read the book of Job, and it says at the end, when Job prayed for his friends, God took away the problem, and he gave him double what he had before. You pray for others as you're doing, and then you don't have to ask any more for yourself. All you have to do is thank the Lord for what he's doing for you. And I want you to get in the attitude of, A, thanking Him for it, and I want you to get in the attitude of, I am a child of God, and I'm going to declare it done. So a man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. Speak forth the answer, because you're doing the right thing, and keep on praying for your friends. All right? Okay, great answer. All right. Brian says, Jesus said in John 3, 8, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Can you explain this for me? Well, you know, somebody's life is suddenly transformed. The guy is a murderer. He's got uh, evil in his heart. And all of a sudden, he has love in his heart. He's tenderhearted. He's doing good things instead of bad things. Where does that come from? Well, it's like the wind. You don't know the source of the wind. Uh, you know, the planet runs around and the winds go you know, normally from west to east. But anyhow, uh, you, 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 you don't know where the winds come. You, you, a gust comes up. You don't know the source of it. So uh, it, it's a mysterious thing. What Jesus says is this isn't something you can analyze scientifically. It's something that happens, a phenomenon you can, you can witness you can see that it happens. You can see somebody's life transformed, but you don't know the exact process that went on when the Holy Spirit comes into somebody's life. That's what he's saying, all right? All right. This viewer writes in, can giving 10% or more to the 700 Club be considered tithing? I thought tithing meant giving to a local church and that giving to organizations such as the 700 Club would be an offering. Uh, no, a tithe is a tenth of your income and uh, it can be given to the Lord's work. You see, this whole idea of a storehouse, they used to say, bring your tithes into the storehouse. Well, there was one temple, and there was one uh, religious uh, place in Israel, and so you brought your tithes into the temple, into the storehouse. But there are many storehouses. There are educational institutions. There are charitable works. There, there are all kinds of relief organizations, and of course, there are a lot of ministries uh, broadcasting the gospel and other things that are doing a tremendous amount of work. It's all part of God's storehouse. And that's what storehouse ties in. There's nothing in the Bible that says it's got to be, quote, a local church. Mm -hmm. But a pastor's like that. That's a good thing for them. Of course they're going to teach that. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, your tithe belongs there. Oh, I've had somebody sit right where you're sitting and say, but it belongs in the local church. Well, why? Where's because, that in the Bible? Because my preacher said it was. Well, <laughs> the preacher has got a good thing going. Why not say it? All right, what's next? Gina says, I'm a 47-year-old Christian who was saved around 22 years old. I'm in my complete right mind, and I'm not on any meds and have no history of mental illness. But every once in a while, I've been hearing a voice whispering, Mom, when I'm either sleeping or resting in bed. A few times I thought it was one of my kids, only to find no one was there. Hearing it has woken me up a few times. What's going on? Is this Satan tricking me? Well, you know, the little boy Samuel heard a voice calling him when he was in the temple, and he went running to Eli and said, you call me? And Eli said, I didn't call you, kid. Go back and go to sleep. So you heard him again. And, and the boy said, Samuel. Mm -hmm. And finally he said, when you just be quiet and say, I'm still Lord, tell your servant what you want to do. And maybe you're hearing from God. So just be still and listen to the voice of God. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Isaiah.
when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Oh, man, we've got some great things for you for tomorrow. And for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you for being with us, and we will see you on the 700 Club at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.